hella black episode 150 you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying i know my math was off on the last episode but i got it right you know uh, luckily we're gonna have some uh math majors potentially on this, this uh get us right. <laughs> episode to get us right you know what i'm saying so hella black episode 150 big milestone huge milestone we're gonna uh go 50 more get to that 200 inshallah you know another 100 after that and another 100 after that you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying uh might have some gray hairs by then. I already got a couple coming. But uh, <laughs> here we are. You know what I'm saying? Uh, appreciate all the support. Make sure you go to our YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Go subscribe to our YouTube. YouTube.com slash Pie. We need to get them views and uh, subscribers up. You know what I'm saying? Especially if we're going to do these videos. Y'all should tap yes, in because we put a lot of work into it. Uh, Jacqueline, our editor, puts a lot of work into uh, the visual aspect as well in terms of like when we talking and bringing certain facts up and whatnot. So. Make sure you go to our YouTube, SoundCloud, Patreon, Spotify, and tap in and rock with us. Very small team, you know, very small team of folks making this happen. You're looking at the producer and the writers uh, outside of Jacqueline, who's doing all the editing. You know, we don't have uh, grants. We don't have government supporting us. But we, we got the people. You know, all, all we got is y'all. Is with the all people. we got is y'all. Power to the so, people. So uh, the power's with the people. <laughs> go to our Patreon. Pull out some of them people's dollars to support the work that we got going on. You know what I'm saying? You know, it goes to uh, real work day in and day out. So appreciate all the support of all the people who do support us day in and day out. You know, uh, the support doesn't go unnoticed, you know, so uh, appreciate it. Especially I know people don't always got a lot, but they still able to support us. So I definitely appreciate that support because y'all don't have to support us. So thank y'all. You know, we got a, a really important episode in store with a couple of guests, you know, uh, uh, both a mentor to me and uh, Delincey, uh, Dr. Loggins left. You know, you all have heard him on this podcast before. Uh, there's been some things going on in terms of Stanford uh, <laughs> doing what a university does uh, to black, to Muslim uh, professors, you know. So we got a good episode in store uh, to talk about some of the facts and ways that people can come come and support. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that's been going on too, that from what I've been seeing is uh, attack on Amir's character uh, in a way that is just really bolstered on lies uh, and paints him in a picture that allows for the institution to justify uh, their lack of principle, moral, and ethical uh, treatment of him, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the same thing we see media and institutions do all the time where if you can dehumanize Run into run a person's character into the ground, then it allows the people to become uh, comfortable to become okay with mm-hmm. any treatment you have to them, and that's we're seeing. You know yeah. what's been happening in centuries. We're seeing it happen, happen, happening, happening, uh, happen to play out in present day. And we see the media what they do. You know, Malcolm tells us about the media and how it's a, a very powerful entity, mm-hmm. and they will use lies and spread the lies uh, so that the lie becomes quote unquote truth and the uh, perception of certain people in the public you know so it's been a, a an attack on amir uh, injustice that's been happening to uh, uh dr loggins you know so uh we got two guests who are gonna you know on the ground working on this situation organizing around the situation because anytime something does happen to us you know we always have a community you know mm-hmm. we always uh might feel like we're in a, a situation of uh disempowerment but when we say power to the people and the community uh gets behind a cause that's where the true power uh is you know so I uh, want to give a warm welcome uh, to our guests. How y'all doing? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, doing great. I can't complain at all. Appreciate y'all joining us on a sex short notice and in the middle of the school day. Of course. How to, how to. Make y'all, rocking, y'all rocking. Can y'all uh, tell us your names, age, uh, where y'all from, what y'all studying, and uh, what prestigious university that y'all was at? I'm Jaden Clark. I study mathematics and comparative studies and race and ethnicities with a potential minor in uh, computer science. So we got a lot going on there, but I'll explain that later. Um, I'm from D.C. Um, currently, I go to school in California at Stanford University. Yeah, that's, that's that. Um, my name is Milo Golding. I'm currently uh, 19 years old, studying bioengineering on the pre-med track uh, at Stanford University. And I'm originally from Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. Um, I'm happy to be here. That's what's up, pre-med, mathematicians, you know what I'm saying? New African uh, scholars, man. New African man. scholars. We got some geniuses on this podcast, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Appreciate y'all uh, y'all being with us. 
So and so, to, to start, um, can y'all each tell us how you were introduced to Doc, Dr. Loggins and, you know, the impact that he's had on y'all personally? Um, yeah. So I remember, like, so Stanford has a quarter system. So it's three quarters of fall, winter, and spring quarter. Um, and there's an introductory, like, writing a rhetoric class called College. Um, and, then, like, Dr. Loggins taught, like, sections for that class. And I remember being introduced to him in spring quarter. And I was just so intrigued because like many of the professors and faculty on campus don't represent like who I am and who we as black students are. Um, so having that space uh, was really interesting to me. So I was enrolled in a college section and like Dr. Loggins section wasn't even my section, but I still, myself and Jada included, uh, we pulled up to Dr. Loggins section like outside of that. Um, and that was when I first introduced, uh, was introduced to Dr. Loggins. And I remember walking in, not knowing what to expect, but like after going out, like after, you know, hearing the discussions that took place and being part of those discussions, I realized what a profound impact, you know, Dr. Loggins has on the community and just on me and relation to like how we contextualize our identity and, you know, making space uh, for us as black students on a PWI for sure. Absolutely. Um, and the way that I got introduced to Dr. Loggins, um, was somewhat unorthodox, but at the same time, it is kind of typical. So I'll go like this. It's kind of like a underground, I don't even know how I want to describe it, like underground telecommunication in terms of like how black students. Y'all got y'all uh, underground railroad up yeah, there yeah, at Stanford. Exactly. Huh? So it's like, you know, even I never had a class with him. Um, I hadn't heard his name prior to someone getting me hit, right? So someone comes up to me, it's like, oh, ooh, like, I think you should really, you know, blood to his class. Um, this is a professor that I think you would really like. And that tends to be the case. So it's it's not strange for you to walk into a section, right? See the people that are in his class and then see like 15 other people not enrolled in his class that are just there listening to him speak. And I was one of those 15. Um, and I think that through meeting him, I continuously made, uh, like I blocked out a section of my schedule, uh, made time just to go to his lecture. Obviously I didn't get any units from it. I didn't get, you know, didn't add <laughs> anything to my GPA, but it added a lot to my character. It added a lot to um, the spaces in which I could feel like I could be unapologetically myself. Um, I've never seen someone that kind of looked like me, talked like me, and was from a similar um, socioeconomic background as I um, in that kind of space, especially not coming here. That was, I got even further removed from a professor that, or a teacher that would have looked like that. So I think he really uh, kind of embodies a lot of parts of my identity that I'm not usually used to seeing um in that space yeah especially y'all being that was y'all freshman class right yes so your first year hearing about the class you know what i'm saying with all these distractions especially being in your first year y'all was choosing to go pull up to the class you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying so i think that definitely speaks to the uh environment that uh, dr loggins was fostering can you speak a little bit more to like how it made you feel being in that classroom especially Y'all being away from home, you know, maybe for the first time. And yeah, how, how was that? All right, I can go first. Um, I think I want to talk about the very first class that I had um, with Dr. Loggins when I pulled up. So I come through. Um, obviously, he doesn't know me. Um, I don't know him. But there's a lot of people in the class who I already know and are expecting me to show up to his class because they've been you know, asking that before, right? He writes on the board. Um, Sausages on a grill. I think that's exactly the quote. Sausages on the grill. He went around the classroom and asked every single person to describe like what that reminds you of. Um, and because of the kind of environment that he creates in his class, a lot of people are excited. They know that he's trying to evoke something um, like personal to you, something that you know speaks towards you. So when it got to me, I was like, oh yeah, like that reminds me of a cookout, you know, hot lakes on a grill, woo -woo, like all this other stuff, you know, glizzies, all this other, you know. So <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about. Um, when he shows like the sausages on the grill, right? Um, after everyone goes, he's like, oh yeah, like everything that y'all said, like that is definitely the best interpretation of this. What if I told you that this was a professor, this is how a professor described a funeral or cremation in Nepal. And then that is where it took a shift. It was just like, wow, this person has seen a professor at our school convey or describe a situation in a very, inhumane way and he's illuminating that to us and he's like this is not how people ought to be described this is not how i would want my grandmother or my mother described and this is not how any of you should want your loved ones described 
And it is then why I started to see how much of a family man he was, how family oriented he was, is. And I think ever since then, I just had to continuously come because I never saw someone teach. It was unprecedented the way, the passion in which he would conduct his lectures. And I felt, I like was personally um, compelled to share, you know, parts of my own life um, that could add to the discussion or add to the conversation. Um, there's so many stories, there's so many examples I can give, but I think that epitomizes the very first time I walked in those lectures, epitomizes just the the care that he takes in terms of um, interacting with the students and also interacting with the coursework. Definitely. I, that was the first class I also went to uh, with Dr. Loggins, and it was coming from like a, a college professor actually, you know, showing pictures of a, crema a family's cremation ceremony uh, from Nepal to like a wide classroom. And, you know, just like breaking that down and contextualizing it in a way that shows that like, as a, like, cause the college course was basically uh, like based on healthcare and medicine, right. And understanding uh, how to use empathy to react, like relate to your patients um, and understanding how that in itself was totally like unempathetic and just like disgraceful in the sense of like, how can you have honor or like be so um, cruel in showing something so personal uh, of a family. Um, but you know, I think my like personal example like falls outside of the classroom where I remember during the summer, like this is after the college section had even passed, like this is like when it finished. Um, I remember just like randomly, I was on campus during the summer just doing research and I get a text from um, another friend who uh, like is like close with Dr. Loggins and Dr. Loggins invited us to go to the Mario Wood ceremony in Oakland um, in like that area. And, you know, I, I went there and just seeing Dr. Loggins like engage with the community and be part of those communities was truly impactful. And it made me question and, and really think about how us as black students on campus can be a part of, you know, the external environment and, you know, really engage with a unifying, you know, um, just us as black bodies unifying towards, you know, um, understanding what we as like a whole can contribute. Um, and, you know, it made me really, really grateful, uh, you know, coming from Kentucky, I lost my father at a young age. Um, and, you know, Dr. Loggins being that source of representation for not only me, but other black students, um, was truly impactful. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. it it's wild, uh, hearing y'all stories. Um, uh, like it's very unfortunate, the situation that's leading to us to even have to have this podcast. Mm -hmm. But it's uh like I also, wish this could have came just from like us interviewing his students, you know yeah, what I'm saying, and just sure. talking about how uh, great of a, a mentor, uh, brother, father, you know what I'm saying, professor. Yeah, he is, like, you know, I wish it could have been like you said under different pretenses, but it's also uh, really beautiful to hear that uh, Amir is still doing the same exact things that he was known to do when I was a kid, you know, because uh. I went to middle school and high school with one of his kids. And you know, I'm in my 30s, so that tell you how long, how far back that go, right? Uh, and I remember just like my first introduction to him. Uh, of course, you know, you know who he is as, as a lyricist and then uh seeing him as a as as a parent, but then engaging with him like my first one-on-one -on -one interaction is playing basketball against him. Uh and so to see that he is still like very much uh functioning in the same patterns, and I can relate to him having those, you know, he's someone that's been by my side from a you know, essentially knowing me when I was a, a preteen to being a teenager, to, to being a young man uh, and has has shaped me. And it's wild to see that across, you know, generations. Uh, and then like you speak to Milo talking about engaging with the community, the fact that the way that he functions off of that campus is the exact same way he going to function in Oakland in Berkeley in San Francisco and Richmond. And it's the reason why uh, so many people uh, love and respect him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to add on to that other point about like, just hooping with Dr. Loggins. I remember that's one of the times, at least that I saw him outside of the classroom. Obviously I was pulling up to a section already, um, mm -hmm. you know, one, two times a week, but it was when we came, it was like maybe like I want to say eight of us. It was definitely enough to run fours, um, but it wasn't quite five because I don't want to say we were half court, but in any case, um, it's just great. Like just being able to call him, Knowing that he's gonna take time out of his day, take out, take time out of the, you know, the time he could be spending with his wife, with his kids, we'll, to go, you know, hoop with students. 
And we be on the court talking in the same way that I would talk to my peer. You know what I mean? He's going to talk to me the same way that he would talk to And, and bro, nice. <laughs> and, and he might, he going to school you in the classroom, school you in the court. Too. <laughs> he do, he, his shot a little good. His shot is a little good. He's like, yeah, you got to work on that shot. You can get up there. I can bang. But he's like, yeah, you, once you get that shot in, then at that point you can start pump faking and get that. So I'm just like, all right, all right. I'm going to start working on it. So, um, but in any case, I think that speaks volumes to um, kind of like, how he prioritizes the people in his life and especially how he prioritizes the students in his life. All right. He sees us as people. He sees us as humans. It's not like he's clocking in, do his little canvas assignment, right. Grade it. And then clocking out as soon as, and you know, getting off campus. No, he's staying two hours after to give us a space to continue to interact with them. He's pulling up to our little three hour hoop run-ins um, and putting that work in. And then right when he's like, Oh, I'm tired. And we're like, Oh, you're not going to run another one. He's going to be like, all right. So now since you said that, I'm going to run another one. Like he's making that effort. He's putting that time in, you know, and I haven't seen any teacher, or at least I haven't, you know, been exposed to any teacher who's who's putting in that amount of um, effort. Yeah, I mean, he really shows how the community is a classroom. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Especially being on college campuses, they always want to talk about community and uh, one Stanford or whatever the slogans that be happening in, in terms of universities. But I think in terms of a community educator. Dr. Loggins is one of the perfect examples of how to be a community educator. You feel me? From him hooping with y'all, I'm sure y'all get lessons from that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Especially as grown into manhood and what it means to be a man, you know? Um, so what was y'all's initial reaction to the news of Dr. Loggins being suspended? Uh, I can speak on that. Um, I remember I was, I was eating lunch or something like that, and I just remember getting a call from Dr. Loggins. And I was, I was, I was just assuming it was just going to be like, okay, it's like a catch up call. Um, just like, see what's up. Um, but then I remember the first thing he said to me was, Hey, Milo, I think I'm at risk of being fired. And in the back of my mind, I was like, that shouldn't be possible. And knowing how much Dr. Loggins cares about his students and, you know, just cares about us as a whole, like as a community, um, it really, it shocked me. Um, and so I wanted to contextualize the situation. So I remember talking with him about it and, you know, the way that in which like Stanford framed, um, you know, what had happened and what had gone on, um, it sounded completely it like it was completely alienated from how like he expressed it. And later on, I, I talked with like other students who were in the class um, and how they expressed it. Um, so I thought this was a grave injustice, especially you know, following, you know, Jaden and I's like experience, um, you know, talking about what the professor like previously in college had did um, and showed to the classroom in the context of like the cremation ceremony and just, you know, dishonoring that personal, um, you know, experience. Um, so I, I was very shocked and immediately I was like, okay, this is wrong. And I think this is injustice. So what can we do in order to, you know, um, you know, get rid of this injustice and make sure that Dr. Loggins, his morale, his his ethical, you know, character is is not, you know, um, you know, dirty and and you know he can remain honorable. Yeah, and um, I want to say the first like time I found out is when Milo reached out to a lot of us. So that goes to show how kind of like our community works. But in any case. I remember when I heard it and then when I looked it up in like the news articles, started publishing things about it, I knew it was false. And I think that speaks volumes to the, the fact that this man who I've met and seen interact in his classroom, it's not matching the descriptions that we're seeing on, you know, mainstream media. It's just not in a way where I could say with complete confidence and conviction that this is just utterly false. And I need to, you know, be able to gauge, you know, where the truth is. Cause it was never a time where I was like, dang, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those situations where it's like, oh, wow, I thought he was like this. And then he did this. That's really crazy. Like, oh, that's unfortunate. It wasn't that it was like, oh, I thought he was like this. I still think he's like this. So this story has to be false. Cause this isn't aligned with the way that I view this person. Um, and they're actually like, they're mutually exclusive. This story and who this person is cannot coexist. So I think that already I was kind of, I was upset. I still am upset. And it's just this long, arduous process of trying to um, clear his name because right now he's being dehumanized. He dry, he, they're trying to thrust him into this group archetype of this, you know, tall, strong, black professor who's just making students feel, you know, unsafe. No, this is a professor that 
reaches out to Hooper students. This is a professor that will go play ping pong. And it's not even just black students. This is a professor who was going to go play ping pong with one of the um, like Asian girls in, in our class, right? This is like, that is who this professor is. He's someone who is trying to make students feel safe, not even in the classroom, but outside of the classroom too, just to build community, right? So I think that like, I was really taken aback by how quick the university was to kind of subvert this story um, in a way so that they could immediately remove him. Because let's be honest, last year they didn't even, they, they didn't offer him like a, a permanent job. So already last year we had the same conversation talking about how do we get him to stay on campus, right? Fortunately enough, right before the school year, um, he was able to get a call in terms of be like, oh, you want to still teach a class? He was like, yes, accepted it this year, right? This was all a surprise to us over the summer. We didn't think he was coming back, right? We was trying to make efforts shake, but it was like towards the end of the year and we couldn't make anything um, happen, unfortunately, right? So this year, given that we were lucky enough for him to be back, right? There's any type of misinformation came to the desk and it was ready to be like, yeah, go ahead, give me your canvas. Let me, you know, draw you from campus. He can't physically be here. Um, they're gonna let the stories happen. They're gonna say that they're gonna have an investigation, but they're not really going about it. Um, they're just trying to stall it and make it, and, you know, have us sit idly until we forget about it, but that's not how this works. He has too much of an impact for us to just forget about it, right? Any other teacher, maybe if they were moved, I'll be like, ah, yeah, like, okay, whatever. I guess he was my math teacher. He was cool, I guess. But no, that's not the way that we can move with him because he he, he was so much more than a teacher. He was so much more than a lecturer. Um, so honestly, my initial reaction to answer your question was just, I was appalled. I felt like I was, I was being removed myself. Um, and him uh, him being gone is is a part of me being gone that's that's as frankly as i can put it how has the community's reaction you know been to that you know specifically you know the black community like how has y'all been feeling around this in, in terms of what it means to y'all like collectively yeah um i think i can speak on that as well i think that the community um is ultimately uh feeling forsaken too. But I don't think that they think this is strange. I think that's that's the key distinction to make. This is disheartening. This is discouraging. But at the same time, it's not surprising. Stanford has little to, they, they, they have little to no regard for having professors or faculty that make communities of color feel seen, heard, or loved. That's just what it has been. And it's been repeated to be that. So when we by chance get someone who does fill that void, um, they're quick to... <laughs> have that void be there again. Um, so I think that for the black community, the broader black community, they look at this situation and been like, wow, like this, the university is doing something like this again. And to kind of make this even broader, make it intersectional with other issues, the whole Stanford student body is already upset with the university's response in regards to the conflict in Gaza right now, right? They claim to take a neutral stance, but they uh, release various statements that, you know, explicitly condemn um, the actions, the terrible actions that happened by Hamas, but they don't explicitly condemn is the Israeli government for um, the atrocities they've done for over 75 years. This is like, we understand what the university stays on this, and a lot of people don't agree with how the university is responding to this, right? There's been hate crime in terms of, you know, Arab Muslim students on campus. Um, they've been protecting this tenured pro-Israel professor for calling students that has been harassing students, calling students terrorists, calling them useful idiots. These, this is the environment that we're living in. Now, there's a crazy solidarity, I think, is forming between Black students and Palestinian students or Arab and Muslim students on campus where you're seeing um, they're looking at this situation as like, wow, this person was speaking up for Palestine as attempting to humanize Palestinians in his lecture and he got taken out um, being claimed like he's uh, some, you know, super dangerous and um, anti-Semitic extremist. And while we're on the same, we're on the same aisle thinking like, okay, yes, this is happening. And also, people who are speaking out um, and showing their solidarity for Palestine are, and are receiving consequences for that are disproportionately black. They're targeting disproportionately black people who are standing up and saying the things that need to be said that the university is afraid to say. Um, so I'm, I'm not only is the black community um, shocked, but I think the Palestinian community and the Arab Muslim community is also shocked. And there's becoming a formation of a solidarity between both of our groups uh, surrounded by this issue because this is intersection with so many things in terms of uh, the problems that Stanford has. With the, with our question, repression is always going to raise consciousness. 
Uh, that, that's what's going to happen. And what you're seeing is a, as, is a raise in consciousness as it pertains to uh, the institution's response to Palestinian resistance uh, in Israeli genocidal occupation. Uh, there are so many things that are at play throughout this situation, but at the core of it is anti-Blackness, uh, is Western capitalist imperialism and the morals and values, uh, the subsequent morals and values that, that follow this ideology and practice, right? But one thing before I go into my next point is I, I want to remind y'all that y'all do have power as students, right? Because the one thing that what I've seen through these different articles from the Stanford Daily and just communications from Stanford was that uh, Amir's removal was about, quote unquote, protecting students, right? Uh, and so now they've created a precedent, set the precedent to where they're about, they're about protecting students. Are y'all not students? Are y'all black students that do not feel protected on campus, right? So y'all have the ability in which a boss can uh, give y'all more practical steps as a former student organizer who pushed his racist capitalist institution to provide more resources for the black students on campus. Y'all do have power. Uh, that's without question. Y'all have to continue uh, to organize, right? But one point that I wanted to make was this story has really grown legs, right? To where folks aren't even sure of what claims, what the reason Amir has been removed for, right? It's, it's really grown legs. And uh, what has happened in the midst of this is that some students have even already come out to debunk what was what was what he's been accused of in terms of oh making students uh, pick up their stuff and calling them colonizers and students in the class was like that's not what happened whatsoever, right? But as you can see, the reporting that's coming from this. Uh, it backs the false claims. And it goes back to, again, what he was doing was essentially just asking questions. Mm -hmm. The questions that y'all posed in your article, right? Or in your statement, is this a fair fight? And so we have to, at all times, we have, uh, what this whole thing is about is our duty and our obligation to the truth. Period. Absolutely. I think it's also sad, right? I can only, from what I'm seeing from y'all so far is that he's the only black professor that y'all, black male professor that y'all, y'all weren't even in his class, but whose class y'all been able to to sit in. I went to three colleges. I've never had a black male professor. And was he the only, he was a GA at the time you were up there? He was a, uh, yeah, I'm a teacher's assistant, essentially, or a, a, a GSI, graduate student <clears throat> instructor. Did you have you any know? other? Uh, but I, I was able to take one of his, so he was my GSI, I believe my junior year, right? Um, and then I took a summer course that he was teaching himself. So what does it know? say about four black men, black kids who on a podcast right now, four male black kids, black men on a podcast that say, we've never had any black male professors? <laughs> Him and Robert Allen. Those are my two. <laughs> like It's a shame, bro. And that's the anti-blackness I'm speaking to Straight at the up. core of it. And it makes when you realize yeah. that all of us have gone through these different institutions have not had any black male professors. This is why it makes yeah. sense as to why they can lie on one, why they can dispose of one so easily and not care the true impact he's having mm -hmm. on people across generations. Mm -hmm. It's about generations of black men, black people in general. Ain't he a black professor that makes you feel communal? You feel me? That makes you feel loved. You feel me? That makes you feel like I'm trying to learn today. I'm trying to figure this out. This is exciting to learn about. You know what I'm saying? Because you could get a black professor and not feel how you feel about Amir. You know what I'm saying? About Dr. Loggins, right? There's a certain... Uh, uh, who he is as a person, who he is as a human being, you feel me? Who he is as a black man, you feel me? It's always been about community. It's always been about like communal practices. It's always been about doing things, what I would say, for the sake of humanity. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you always talk about all oh, these, uh, uh, you know, playing uh, table tennis uh, with, with other students, you feel me, who ain't black. You feel me? That's, that's just the character of him, you know? So I think it's important when we talk about uh, a black professor, like he's a black professor who's about the community. You know what I'm saying? Who's actually about true education and education in a way that uh, can actually benefit you in your growth as a human being. <laughs> and then for y'all as two young black men being able to be mentored by his education uh, and be able to think about y'all your, yourself differently. You know what I'm saying? Like even what I do now, I feel like if I didn't see someone like Amir doing it when I was 21, 20 years old, you feel me? He gave a playbook. You feel me? I'm like, ooh. I remember seeing him speak in 2014, right? I'm like, I'm trying to talk like that. <laughs> I, I want to talk like that one day, you know? So it's like having that example, you know, they always say, oh, we don't have examples as black men. And then when you have an example, <laughs> a great example, they lie on your name. They try and get you. They, they suspend you. 
You feel me? They dehumanize you when literally <laughs> he should be a tenured professor at that Without university. Question. Absolutely. And I think to add on to that, I think it's 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 so great to it, it's been such a pleasure to see the roles that he plays in terms of like being community oriented. And I, I'm sure that y'all can speak to this as well. Um when I talked to him one time and he said, you know, like this was last year when um, we were trying to, you know, figure out some way to get him to be, you know, rehired for the, you know, subsequent year um, and the subsequent years, years following, having giving him a more permanent position. And he said, when it comes to organizing, people always think that I'm the Malcolm X, right? I'm, you know, I'm tall, I'm like, you know, sometimes I can speak in a very, you know, um, evocative way in a way that can like rally a crowd together, but that's not really the role that I like. I'm an Ella Baker type. Like I, I was, I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna let y'all. I'm gonna I'm guide you. I'm gonna say, oh, I, if I was you, you would do this. I would, or if I was you, I would do this. Um, I think it would be better if you did this. You should phrase this like this way. But at the end of the day, he wants us to do the work. He's like, this is not about me, right? This is if they want to just have, you know, a black professor on campus, they'll make a black professor be on campus. If they want to give me a class, they'll give me a class, right? What you all need to do is you all need to make explicitly clear that you want a Dr. Loggins in every single department at every single sector of this school. So if they take away one Dr. Loggins, which they have already done now, it isn't like a huge void because there's a Dr. Loggins where I can go to in another department um, to fight for the original one back, right? So it's like, I think that he has this incredible knack to remove individualism in terms of organizing. He removes himself completely. He's like, this is not about me. Sure, I know I need, it's important to latch onto the situation, um, just in the sense that it's like an uh, easy thing to unify around. Um, but this is not something that needs to be isolated within this situation. If they want to rehire me, if they if they if it's easier for the university to be like, hey, we'll give them a class, we'll give them a partner role, woo, 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 but in terms of protecting black students, in terms of giving them space, in terms of you know hiring and tenuring more black Muslim professors in the future. We won't really worry about that. We'll keep that on the back burner, but we'll give him a class. Like if that will make y'all shut up, then we'll give you a class, right? That's not what he wants. And that's not what we want. Um, and he consistently um, repeats that to us. And I think that is what um, is amazing about him in terms of trying to mobilize people. Mm -hmm. If I could speak on that, um, I think that the, the most powerful aspect of Dr. Loggins is that he, as Jaden said, he wants us as like a community to establish a long-term like source of impact for future black students and just black and brown students at Stanford. Um, Cause I, I just remember going into a college section and one day we we're just talking about, okay, what are ways we can make an impact now in relation to the, the creation of a new like African American, African studies department here at Stanford. Um, how can we as a student have a voice um, in the decisions um that like these like higher ups are making um so that in these scenarios it's not at the will of the higher ups and saying like okay you should be grateful for like what we're giving you it's more so like okay um you're giving us these options here are our thoughts and as a student body we would like these needs and these um like these uh goals to be met in the in the sense of like how we can feel most comfortable here and how we can feel like you know, we're represented in the classroom um, and also like within the community as well. Um, and I think that's something that's really powerful um, that Dr. Loggins has really made an impact on us. And, you know, I, I think the thing that both Jade and I are like talking about is like, it's not limited to like black and brown students and it's limited to every student he has like, in, like encountered. And it shows that like whoever is like manipulating like the, the, the narrative and to sully his name um, it shows that like they have to subvert it a lot so that people try to lose like morale in his character um, because, you know, his character is just so um, is it impacted students like of every background here at Stanford um, and like beyond as well, of course. And that's yeah, that's Absolutely. why I commend y'all on our efforts, uh, whether it be the petition that y'all are going or whether it be just even coming on and getting on this podcast, uh, because as it talks about the type of influence y'all want to have on the next generation of black students at Stanford, whether it talks about the influence y'all want to have on this potential black studies department that's, that should have been built, right? Uh, it's setting precedent as to 
what y'all will and won't allow. Like they won't be able to dispose of black faculty. They won't be able to uh, treat black students this way. They won't be able to uh, not take principle, not take anti-genocidal stances that y'all gonna demand more. Uh, and it also take a lot of heart and courage. And so I, I, I definitely commend y'all on uh, the work that y'all doing and, and applaud it and, and push y'all to keep doing more. Yeah, second that for sure, especially because what y'all is doing is y'all is now setting a new standard for what it means to be a black student at Stanford, right? So when they come for one of your professors or when they come for a student or where they come from uh, or whether they come for a, a, a worker, you feel me? Y'all showing as black students, like, hey, <laughs> we united about ours and we ain't going to let this happen. And we're going to protest. We're going to struggle uh, and, and show our humanity. <laughs> Even if you don't see it, we're going to show it, you know, so. Uh, definitely commend all the work that y'all is doing. And, you know, this is a, you know, you were talking about Dr. Loggins and, and how he's wanting to, you know, be like, uh, play the background role. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all are showing that y'all are stepping up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If if this was an assignment <laughs> in one of his classes, you know what I'm saying? Y'all was showing up for the Ooh. assignment <laughs> in, in this moment, you know? I, I want to revisit something that y'all done brought up a few times. And so just to make sure it ain't swept under the rug, because... It was something that another student from Stanford, not even connected to y'all, had brought up about an incident that happened on campus before the summer where, uh, I, I don't know if, I think this professor was white, but he showed a slide of, I believe, like a, a cremated Asian person and said it reminded him of, of barbecue. And so I'm like, okay, I go and look it up. You can't find it nowhere. And this just happened a few months ago. Just happened a few months ago from what I'm hearing, right? Uh, so what was what was Stanford's response to that? Because I believe I, the student who told me was like, you know, the next day students went in like, hey, you owe us an apology. You feel me? Like this was uh, what you did was out of pocket, unprincipled, racist. Uh, and there was no response from Stanford. From what I understand, the teacher wasn't suspended. There was no communications about how uh, Stanford's going to work to keep the safety of students at the forefront. Even though students demanded an apology from this person, mm -hmm. a whole classroom mm -hmm. of people. And then you got professors calling students terrorists, <laughs> calling them all these different mm -hmm. types of names, harassing students, yeah. and they're just allowed to do that on campus. But someone asks a question <laughs> and is suspended and yeah. then is lied on, dehumanized. So what are we talking about here? <laughs> what are we talking about? Exactly. So there was no action, there was like no action could, for that yeah. teacher. No, nothing. yeah, I, I feel like I could I could speak on like what had had, had happened because like I was in that lecture that oh, you day, were in the class and I remember I was in the class um and I remember uh because it was a big like lecture hall like lots of bodies mm -hmm. there right and it was a big screen and we were talking about it's funny it's it's hypocrite right this this lecture because we were talking about empathy in you know talking with like families and talking with um you know people who are who are sick, mm -hmm. who are ill, um, so that they can feel understood as a patient. Funny enough, mind you, this guy is in palliative care. This lecturer is in palliative care. And that like that literally is for, you know, people who are in the process of like um like being ill and possibly, you know, dying or or has the mm -hmm. risk of that, right? Um and then just for at the at the very end of the class, he pulled up a, a like a slide um that showed uh, like a family's cremation, like burial ceremony in Nepal. And I remember him saying like, oh, on my travels in Nepal, I, I thought this was very interesting and showing like, uh, like, oh, the, this ceremonial aspect of like death and stuff like, and I remember thinking to myself, if my, if someone came to the hospital the day my father passed away and just took a picture of my mom and I, like just standing there, right? I would feel disgusted. I, I would feel because again, he didn't have any, um, you know, authority to take that picture. He didn't have any permission. He didn't right? have a press or anything like that. Yeah, he was, he was just walking that. there and he saw it and took a picture of it and showed it to a whole classroom of students. Right? Okay. So there's something called Fizz on Stanford, which is like our like campus, like um, like social mm -hmm. media basically is like circulates like what's going on campus, right? It gets brought up on campus, right? I think later that day he issues like a very brief apology and it was it was formatted in a way that it's like okay if you have any questions or I'm I'm sorry for this and if you want to clarify anything you could just come to my office hours and we could like talk it out I'll, I'll have office hours for this um and 
I right when like Dr. Loggins was t- like on a call I had with Dr. Loggins, I was thinking to myself, this is such a clear double standard, um, such a clear double standard in the way that the university is handling this um, and like you know selling Dr. Loggins' character when in contrast like this professor was able to get away with it like with a simple like letter and like office hours, right? I, I think that's like a clear demonstration of how like this professor who explicitly said something terrible and showed something terrible, um, like, and they disregarded the honor of, of, you know, human, like the human life and, and the ceremony of that. Um, I think that's such a clear double standard. Absolutely. And I was, I wanna, and I was just going to add on to that and say that like, it's not only is it just a double standard, it's so absurd to me how the university mm-hmm. just thinks, this is okay to allow this person to stay. Mind you, this was not posted on the Stanford Daily. This was not posted, at least I don't think. So it was essentially like swept under the rug. It was essentially swept under the rug. If you were not a part of the college team or your friend wasn't maybe a part of the college, you would have not known this. I guarantee there's people on this campus. I would guarantee that actually the majority of this campus know nothing about this situation, right? (laughs) Which I think is, like, I just, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. And I think that, People are starting to see these hypocrisies more and more. People weren't aware of that situation. Um, there's a professor on this campus. Her name is Judith Friedman, is who I talked about, who's calling students terrorists, right? She's a genetics professor, tenured at this school as well. So keep that in mind, right? There was a hate crime, like I mentioned, um, hit and run, where this Arab Muslim student was just walking on campus. White dude with glasses came in, hits him, says, F you and your people, and then runs away. Clear hate crime. She goes out and says that this student is a pathological liar. And her evidence for this is a screenshot from that same Fizz post, which, mind you, are just anonymous students just, like, saying random stuff mm-hmm. online. It says, like, look, he's a pathological liar. You're a tenured professional. Like, you're an actual tenured professor, and you're sitting here going back and forth with students. There's videos of her sitting here going like this when she had to get the police called. Wait, her. so there's this a tenured so professor like, who's had the police you- called on them to the point where they made a student, they mm-hmm. made a student, and community members feel so unsafe. That, that the police were called that and this person still teaches there. Mm-hmm. And the, pe- was the that professor's the still here. And this isn't, this isn't <laughs> was that national ever news. On and yet the person I, no. who didn't make anyone feel like they needed to call the police, who didn't make anyone feel like, oh my goodness, like I'm just scared, like I'm just trembling in fear right now, who didn't make anyone feel that way, he is being, you know, trending on Twitter and he is getting death threats and his family is getting death threats. Like that. Yeah, I, 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 can't say more yet. I think something crazy to think about is that this is like they're trying to make an example of a professor, of a black Absolutely. Muslim professor who tried, who was just creating a, a, a relation of empathy for Palestinian civilians who are experiencing, you know, the terrorism that they're experiencing. Um, and for that, he's being sullied and lynched in the media while, you know, these like tenured professors, these like palliative care doctors who should know what they're about are, are going in great lengths to be one, unempathetic and they're, they're making students feel unsafe. And, you know, it's this, it, it, you know, it makes me question, okay, which students is Stanford really caring question. about? <laughs> and yeah, and question. like, you know, exa- exactly. And like, you know, if you're able to dispose of Dr. Logan so easily for doing this, what am I? What am I to the Stanford University as an institution? What am I? Your diversity right? ploy. Like, Your diversity is, what is, ploy, with the hope that one exactly. day you might be a neo-colonial agent that they can lean on, that you'll give billions. You talking about exactly. y'all a math major? One of y'all is a math major. Oh, yeah, come on, we we need that. Y'all Free poster, man. y'all poster boys for them. <laughs> Straight up, y'all poster <laughs> boys. We have a situation here where you have a teacher who doesn't ask, who doesn't say, "Look at y'all, I'm finna show y'all cremation. Do I have y'all consent to show this real quick?" I recognize this might bring up something for some people. Can I show you all this real quick? It doesn't matter if he asks for consent to say, I'm actually going, I'm also going to compare these people to barbecue. Wouldn't matter if he asks for consent to that. That's just it's out of pocket, no matter how you cut it. You have another tenure professor mm-hmm. who has had, who has made students feel so safe, so unsafe that they call the pigs. Then we're dealing with a situation where Amir just asks, do we think what's happening in, as it pertains to the Palestinian and Israeli conflict is a fair fight and this is what gets him removed because what they're saying in the Stanford Daily is uh, Jewish students are unsafe on campus because of him 
and, right. it's, and it's crazy. And it, it was two questions. Mm-hmm. Let me keep that in mind. Let me mind you. The class is called Why College, um, Education in the Good mm-hmm. Life. That's mm-hmm. what the class is called. So, in the very first lecture of of that class, he said he asked the students, "Oh, what is necessary for a good life?" Everyone's saying, "Oh, food, water, right, gas, electricity." Ooh, like everyone's mm-hmm. just answering what is necessary for a good life. In this lecture. To give you a sense of how this is not, this was not just a black, like a Rant. just sporadic black man walking in, speaking out of his not really like, oh my God, like, oh, oh, oh. this is not what this is. This is a scripted, planned lecture that uses the readings and is pulling on past previous lectures, right? So he goes, okay, so we had this conversation. So the first question was, from a humanistic perspective, are Palestinians living a good life? Mind you, we, told, we talked about the things that people need to have a good life. life. Yeah. them to be considered mm-hmm. right access to water electricity mm-hmm. energy things like this all things that Palestinians are not having mm-hmm. right not having to be susceptible to constant policing or constant questioning right simple basic necessities for someone to have a good life so he's asking this question are Palestinians living a good life right the second question is now militaristically is this a fair fight I don't think though if the, if those two questions if we don't have space on our campus to what talk about doing? those two questions, mm-hmm. then this sets exactly. the precedent for dangerous fascism, for crazy censorship, which they're already starting to do for mm-hmm. people in the military program. Right? There was an article maybe released I want to say a week ago that's like, oh yeah, now they're having meetings with people that were in the same fellowship program that he was in. My new only black person in that fellowship program, where they're saying that, oh yeah, now uh, this professor was saying too much of the facts. So let's start making a precedent set right now. Y'all can't start speaking your minds. Follow like this, this specific robots. syllabus Follow and follow it this way. We want a robot. We want yeah. to say, you could only say this at this time. Essentially following a whole playbook. By definition, that's you fascism. You actually, yeah, period. Like, hey, here's a book. Yeah. Don't ask who wrote it. Just read it. And teach and it this it way. And call it a lecture. And teach it this <laughs> specific way. Yeah. Because he's he was way. pulling that's, that's from really his syllabus. Good. From right. a book that they have already read, from a book that y'all are reading, it wasn't like I pulled this out the crack of my asked. ass. It was it was going to happen. So from a uh, to use the terms a pedagogical Pedagogy. standpoint, <laughs> <laughs> from the pedagogy, this is right in line with the pedagogy. <laughs> so what do we talk about? So here? You spend but six again, years in school for to get your PhD to do exactly like, that. This is what I was trained to do. This is what I was hired to do. This is what y'all asked me to do. This exactly reminds me. Yeah. This exactly reminds me of that one. Um, I think this was a couple years ago, but like this president is still here. Like the president is still here today, and like the media. But like I remember that one like white reporter who said, "Oh, mm-hmm. shut up and dribble!" Right? <laughs> they just want us to just go through the motions and just okay. You're you're Stanford mm. under these contexts, right? You're Stanford mm-hmm. under these contexts, and like if you go outside of these contexts and think a certain way, I think they're showing that the precedent is that okay. You have to conform to what we believe. And I think in, in an educational setting and in academia, that is extremely dangerous because one, like who are you, who are like, they expecting us to benefit, right? Um, they want to like, they just want to be benefited from like, oh, like your, your prowess, your educational prowess. The intellectual right? ability. Um, the curiosity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But what is that? exactly but like what is that intellectual ability and curiosity without divergent thinking right like that doesn't make any sense to me um and it's it's just um it's it's very telling i'll say that it's very telling yeah yeah and like to add on to your point it's so it's it's so wild to me because it's like this is this is how they frame this this is how they frame this they say that your presence alone dr loggins in this fellowship program as a black muslim lecturer that's gracious. We are doing you a crazy favor by allowing you to even be here. So with that being said, if you do anything that violates these conditions that we have kind of boxed out for you, you have forsaken us in the university and they genuinely feel forsaken when he says, when he teaches in a way that makes students feel safe. That is what this is like, this is being framed. That's really what it is. It's being like, yeah, how could you be so entitled as to actually teach the class in a way that connects current events with the coursework. How could you? How could you do that? You're gracious. We are great being like gracious to you by allowing you to teach. Period. So let's be cute and 
teach Stay to exactly in line, how we want you to teach. Period. <laughs> Stay yeah. in line. Yeah, and it's Basically. also what happened is they put him on the chopping block as a message to any other Stanford professor, uh, lecturer, mm -hmm. graduate student. Mm -hmm. If y'all, if you ask a question, we are going to treat you how we treated Dr. Loggins. Right, it's in the, when you're just talking about Jaden, like yeah. all the uh, the different things that play. You know what I'm saying? We talking about anti-black racism. <laughs> we talking about Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So it's like, all right, mm -hmm. you black professors don't think about it. <laughs> you Muslim professors don't think about it. And if y'all do ask these questions, if you do have an analysis, if you do talk about it, even on Instagram or social media, trust that we gonna know about it. <laughs> And we gonna do something about it. This sets a national precedent. Right? This sets a, a national a dangerous precedent. national precedent mm -hmm. to where there's no investigation. And then even these terrible the, these journalists, right? These so called journalists. I don't even want to use the word journalism because it ain't journalism. What we should really call them is propagandists. If an article says and students were in that classroom saying what that what some students said that are lying, students said that, but that's nowhere in any of these national articles. Because the so story you're already you're grows not even legs. Doing journalism. It grows legs. It grows. You feel me? So that, that's the. Uh, it's it's like uh, Marvel. You were saying like this is a, a, a lynching of his character, mm -hmm. but you have to mm -hmm. uh, assassinate yeah. somebody's this, character, the why... and then what's happening now? Death threats. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, okay, yeah, he was yeah. this person. He was this uh, crazy black professor. You know what I'm saying? But really, he's a father. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, a scholar, an educator, a professor, a hooper. You feel community me? leader. A community leader. You feel me? Like, and this is what they're trying to do. Because that also sets a precedent to people yeah. who are communal like that. That this is not a space for you. You should not exist here. We're, like you're saying, Jaden, we're doing yeah. you a favor. Be happy. Here's your Stanford shirt. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's, it's the reason in the fact that this is something that that we need to start harping on more, which is the fact that they're now having this meeting where they're bringing everyone in, in his pre, his previous, you know, cohort members, right? And being like, oh yeah, like, I mean, it's, it, we need to, we need to make sure that we kind of rile in this fellowship program now. Um, and let's make sure that this doesn't happen again. It's the reason why slave masters, when they're going to beat a slave, they're going to beat them in front of all the other slaves. It's just saying like, mm -hmm. yeah, if you want to act out of line, if you want to, if you have the idea, if you have an inkling in your body that makes you that possesses you to think that you can do this. Let me go ahead, look over there. Let me see what you did, what we did to your mans, and then rethink that. Right? It's like that's how they're trying to operate, so mm -hmm. that it's very clear to anyone else that may come later, or that is in the fellowship program and thought about thinking their minds um, or speaking their minds, mm -hmm. that you can't do that here, especially if you're coming from a marginalized community. You especially, we have less grace for you to do that. Mm -hmm. here. Um, and I don't know. I think it's, it's indicative of a larger problem that hopefully we can, we can make strides to, to address in a, in a tangible what, uh, way. So tell us about what y'all have going on as it pertains to uh, the support of Dr. Loggins and what can, you know, listeners and supporters of Hella Black and uh, people's programs do to support y'all in your endeavor. Mm -hmm. I th I think um so uh Jaden has been working Jaden and I have been working on like a, a petition and like how many signatures are there on the petition Jay? Um currently I want to say there's over I can literally check right now. Mm -hmm. Um, one thousand three hundred. It only been up for about mm -hmm. a little over twenty four hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. two, days. two days. Yeah. All our listeners will link two days, this right petition. Um, uh, on the YouTube channel and uh, on the Ooh. podcast. So you feel me? Also, we'll uh, link it on, on our Instagram page as well. So be sure to go take one minute and sign the petition. You feel me? Yeah, not even not even a minute. It takes mm -hmm. like 30 seconds. You can sign it even if you're not affiliated with Stanford. Um, you can put a Stanford community member or you can use the other and just say, you know, just here to support, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that petition coming out. Mm -hmm. We plan on Milo was great enough to um, make a flyer mm -hmm. uh, we plan to get that mass printed out. Mm -hmm. It's been great. Um, I've been really in close communication with the Stanford SJP mm -hmm. and the Center to Stop Genocide that's happening at our campus right now. Uh, they have had a lot of resources that have been able to help. So they've been able to help us like with mass printing. Um, we have a Stanford Daily article hopefully coming out to kind mm -hmm. of pub that. Um, 
sent out a press release. So there's a whole lot of interviews coming out about that. We were supposed to have a rally today, actually, but um, it unfortunately got postponed that I was set to speak at. So all is that to say that this is definitely the, not the last that you're going to hear of us um, from us, from Black students on campus, from Palestinian students on campus, because at the end of the day, logins made a lot of people feel seen. They made a lot of people feel um, heard, right? Whether it be that Mexican kid from South Central, that's my friend Pablo, who also was there, whether it be a Palestinian girl, whether it be, you know, that Japanese boy that used to come in, whether it be Jewish boys, there's just this people. We have a running document of testimonies of people writing, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere from 50 words to 500 words just about how the impact that they had on his life. And it's from mm -hmm. all dem different demographics, ethnicities and um, and communities. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, this is definitely not the last you're going to hear. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think uh, like we're we're making sure that our voices don't go unheard and there's no feasible way for Stanford University as an institution to look away from like what they did um, and you know think about making sure that there are pathways aligned so that in the future this is not even a scenario that could happen and there's already like um, like enough like as Jay said like Dr. Loggins in every department that we as the Stanford Black community and just like marginalized groups on campus can feel safe in and feel comfortable in um, and we can feel like we're being prioritized as well um, in these situations. Um, and yeah, we just keep is up not the, the good work, man. Y'all ain't doing sure. nothing but picking up a torch. Uh, whether it was Amir uh, guiding a boss in his work at, at UC Berkeley, or you talk about the long history of uh, the Black radical tradition uh, in these institutions, whether you talk about the Black Panther Party being started at uh, Old Oakland City College, right? Whether you talk about the work of uh, Walter Rodney in Dar es Salaam University in, t in, in Tanzania. Uh, y'all are doing work that is always going to be necessary uh, for new Africans, for Africans across the diaspora, uh, as we continue to fight for our social, economic, and political uh, interest and power, right? As a result of, you know, Western imperialism and the phenomenon of fucking capitalist imperialism and neocolonialism and colonialism. So y'all keep grinding and, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be here as a resource, period, point blank. This is going to extend past the Justice for Logins campaign and making sure that uh, we do our part as community organizers uh, to give y'all the support that y'all need to really impact that campus. And cause y'all not gonna be the last black students to come through there. Y'all gonna have a new uh, class of folks coming in next year, class after that, class after that. And y'all can, I think about the work that, and I should just give a little overview on that for y'all to understand some of the work that he did at UC Berkeley to establish some of the resources that they had uh, because they in fact did create the conditions for black students uh, to have Maybe not the best, but at least a better experience than what they had on that campus. <laughs> it's still going to be bad, but what can you do when you're there? You know what I'm saying? Like, especially thinking about it from that framework, when we was doing work at Cal, you know, we had 10 demands for institutional change. One of the demands was to create the Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center, right? Uh, which was one of our biggest demands because we had essentially a small little office. You feel me? That only like five people could fit in, 10 people at most. Uh, and that was the only space for black students at UC Berkeley. You feel me? An institution that's named after uh genocidal slave owner you feel me literally berkeley is named after george berkeley you feel me uh so we had 10 demands for institutional change and through that demand process of organizing of protesting of literally shutting down cal day which was one of the biggest recruitment days for cal where everyone goes out to party and stuff i'm shutting that down like we were able to get our demands met yeah. you know what i'm saying so even if it's a small group we were a small group but we were able to mobilize people you know and as long as you're committed uh to the goal y'all gonna be victorious <laughs> y'all gonna be victorious you feel me because uh if you have that commitment in your heart and you have that passion you know what i'm saying and and that steadfastness y'all gonna be able to make it move forward you know so I, i'd encourage y'all to think about uh ways uh, not only getting justice for uh, dr loggins but what does it look like to get justice <laughs> in general on that campus for black students you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying because y'all might be laying the foundation mm -hmm. uh for a jade in 10 years now uh, 10 years uh uh, in the future, you know what I'm saying? Coming to that campus and having a better experience. And then that person is picking up the torch to move forward. You know what I'm saying? So that's how we, uh, we got to think, you know what I'm saying? It's like, how are y'all going to mentor the freshmen? You know what I'm saying? And then how are they going to mentor the next people? You know, you know, so that torch is always being passed uh, with each generation. And then how, or when y'all graduate, how are y'all going to be a part of the community? How are y'all going to uh, have that same type of impact mm -hmm. that uh, Dr. Loggins has had on y'all? You know, that's how we, truly build power so for y'all as black students y'all got a lot of power 
there's a, a big history of it, <laughs> a big history of it. And y'all should see yourselves uh, as part of that history now. You know, like, hey, some people write books. Uh, y'all are making the books that people write about. <laughs> and y'all might write about them too one day, you know. So see yourself as as stewards of that history and, and just know uh, me and Delincey, uh, People's Programs, we support y'all. Uh, anything we can do, you feel me? Uh, and, and it's in our reach. We're going to be able to do it for y'all. So uh, appreciate everything y'all is doing. And, and I would say last thing is, if it's not coming through and what we're saying is uh, don't take it lightly because you never know where this this effort, this passion, this principled action that y'all taking on could, could lead y'all, right? Uh, that student organizing that Abbas was doing, that's how me and him met. You know, I was a journalist doing local, you know, doing some local reporting and I wrote on the 10 uh, demands for institutional change. And from that writing, that's how our relationship started. And a few years after that, we started People's Programs, right? And now we in our sixth year of the organization uh, taking what we learned from these college campuses uh, and providing real resources and material change on the ground to the community of Oakland. And so, uh, again, if you use principles and you use steadfastness, steadfastness like Abbas was alluding to earlier, y'all cannot do no wrong. Uh, and it's no telling how that will manifest in the future. And so keep y'all head up, you know, keep y'all feet to the ground, and uh, y'all be happy with the result mm -hmm. without question. Because they gonna say no to certain things. and be like, oh, we don't care. But force them to care. <laughs> use your strategy. Use action. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. use, use the power of the pen. Use the power of protest, of direct action, of, of shutting things down. You know, there's a, a lot of tools at y'all disposal. But don't ever let them put y'all in, uh, in a space of fear like, the, like that y'all can't win. Because we can win. And it has been proven time and time again. If anything, our history shows us. It shows us that if we struggle, if we dare to struggle, <laughs> we can win. You know. Thank you so much for talking to us and extending your resources. Mm -hmm. Definitely takes a Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much. Really appreciate y'all. Uh, appreciate y'all and anything y'all need, you feel me? Tap in with us for sure.